Hi, this is the third lecture in ET250. Uh, today we're going to cover two examples. Uh, then we'll look at a simple switch and some, some of the assumptions behind it. Um, we'll look at how to um, compute uh, the equivalent resistance for resistors in series and in parallel. Uh, basically, you add resistors in series and you add the reciprocal for resistors in parallel. Uh, we'll look at this thing called a galvanometer, which is essentially a current sensor. And then the last thing we'll look at is an example of how we can apply the galvanometer to a multimeter circuit. Uh, and we'll bring in all the concepts that we've learned this far in the last two lectures. So uh, let's start with our example first. Okay. So if you recall, we've gone over Ohm's law, we've gone over KVL, KCL, and power. And so this example kind of brings all that together. And so we have a simple system here with two resistors, two voltage so sources, and the question asks, find V1, which is all the way over here, V2, I, and V. And notice that all the polarities and current directions are labeled. Also notice that there's no element here between this node and this node. Uh, but they are interested in that voltage. And so this voltage you can think of as actually the voltage across these two combined elements, the voltage supply and the resistor, or the voltage across these two elements, okay? Um, it's just like a measurement as if I took my multimeter and just went, well, what's that voltage? And so we're gonna see if we can compute it. All right, so what are some strategies that we can, um, that we can use to go over? Well, what do we have? We have KCL, KVL, Ohm's Law, and power, right? And so if we look at um, some things I've written, uh, we can see that all these elements are in series, right? That means the current is the same throughout all of these elements. We also notice three voltage loops. There's one main voltage loop. We could write a KVL over here, or we could write one for the left and one for the right, okay? Um, and one thing I wanted to hit is that the loop, when you do a KVL loop, does not require a physical element. So for example, if you do this loop on the left or the right, you can do a loop right through this uh, uh, measurement, I guess you could say, and it doesn't have an element here, and that would still be valid, okay? All right, and like I said, what are the strategy? We can just pick all the equations and tools we have and go, uh, go at it. So if we look at KCL, it's probably not gonna be so useful because we only have, you know, one, there's not multiple branches, right? And only one current, and we know the current's the same. But KVL could be very useful. Also, we have two resistors here, and so immediately that screams out, let's use Ohm's law, right? So um, that's exactly what I do, is I use Ohm's law first, right? So we go, okay. If we do Ohm's law for this first resistor, that's V equals IR, all right? So in this case, do we use the positive version or the negative? Well, if we look at this current and bring it all the way over here, you can see that that current would hit the positive terminal first, so that's probably the positive version. And the same is true for this two kilo ohm resistor here where it hits the positive. So we're gonna use the positive version in both of these. Now we have to be careful. Notice I have a K for kilo here. So it's not just regular ohm. So we got to account for that when we do our final answer. So don't forget that. So if I see a kilo, I actually like to put that unit in, right? In the intermediate part. So I remember at the end to, to account for it, okay? The other thing we look, it looks like we can use is uh, KVL. So we could do a KVL around this loop. And so what would that be? Negative 14 plus V plus two plus V1 equals zero, okay? And it looks like I have the same thing, negative 14 plus V plus two plus V1 equals zero. Uh, and it also looks like I could take these two Ohm's laws that I had previously written and substitute them into my KVL, and that would leave me with one equation, one unknown. It doesn't always simplify so nicely to something like that, but in this case it does. And that's great, because now I can solve for this I and I get I is 12 divided by, so if I bring this 12 over, uh, divided by four plus two is six. Now I gotta be careful, because again, I have that kilo, so that means the answer I get is two milliamps, not two amps, two milliamps, or equivalently 0 0.002 amps. It would be the same thing, so I would accept either answer. Okay, so two milliamps is flowing in a clockwise fashion around the circuit, good. Good. And it seems, does that intuitively make sense? I have a 14 volt source here. Uh, that's going to overpower this two volt. Yep, I'm 
I'm pushing current this way. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And even before we calculate the power, if we were to calculate power, these three are probably going to be absorbing current or absorbing energy, right? Because uh, these are resistors and it looks like the current is going to go into the positive terminal here and this is going to be a positive number when we calculate the power absorbed. So again, always try to figure out what is the intuition as you go and calculate numbers. Okay, let's keep going. So we have I. It sounds like we're almost there because we can immediately get V and V1, right? Because now we take this I value and plug it right back into the Ohm's law and that is solved. So let's do that. And when we do that, we take the two milliamps times this four, looks like we're gonna get eight volts. Notice the milli and the kilo cancel. So it's just two times four, that's kind of nice. Same with two times two, we get just four volts. So done, done, uh, done, done, done. We still got to find V2. At this point, it's pretty trivial because now we can apply that KVL either around the left or the right loop. We know these two voltages. So if we apply a KVL around here, we're going to get that unknown, or we can do a KVL around here. Either one, at this point, it's your choice. Um, and so that's the last step. I, in, in my example solution, I chose the right side. So minus V2 plus two volts plus V1 equals zero. And because I know what V1 is from here, that goes, a four goes in there and it looks like V2 is equal to positive six volts. So there's a higher pressure of six volts relative to that point. And I think that makes sense. Look, if this current's going down, I'm gonna get a higher pressure here. I have a higher pressure here. These are gonna stack up, right? Like two batteries in series. And I'm gonna get an even higher voltage up here. So two plus four, six, yay, okay? All right, now the next question, oh good. What is the power absorbed for each element? Well, like I said before, it looks like these three better come out to be positive numbers and it looks like that better be negative. And in fact, not only will this be negative, this, the value of this better equal the sum of these three things, right? So if I took the total sum of everything, it better equal zero, right? Power is conserved, right? So what's our power equations? Well, we can walk down the list for the 14 volt here P is negative I times 14. Why negative? Well, if we follow that passive sign convention, look at that I, it hits the negative terminal, negative, yay. So that's I times 14, good. We go to the next one for the two volt, let's say, the other source, I hits the positive terminal, I times two, good. Okay, we go to the next resistor. We can use, ooh, we can use our I squared R formula. We could either use the I squared R, the V squared over R, or the IV for these two resistors. That's nice. But because we know the I, we know the R, let's just use this one. I squared R, great. And then same with uh, the two kilo, um, two kilo ohm one, I squared R as well. So now we can just punch in the numbers. Now we have to be careful again. Look at how I wrote just the general formula, I squared R, I squared R. I got to make sure that I use the correct R for this one and not the same one, even though I use the same symbol. All right. Now, in this case, the I is all the same. It's all this uh, two milliamps. But these R's are not the same. This R corresponds to the four kilo ohm one and this R corresponds to the two kilo ohm. Don't make that mistake. Okay. So let's punch it in. I have two milliamps here times 14. Now I don't have like a kilovolt. So that means that milli stays in the picture, which means I'm gonna get an amp times a volt, which we know is watt, but I'm gonna get milliwatts if I don't change any decimal. So yes, sure enough, I get minus 28 milliwatts. And yes, this is delivering positive 28 milliwatts because it's a negative number. Okay, let's go to the next one. Two milliamps, two volts, yep, four milliwatts. Don't forget that milli for the milliwatts, okay? Let's go to the next one, four kilo. Good, I was, I was uh, careful, I put the four kilo ohm. Now, again, I gotta be careful. You might think, oh, the mill and the kilo cancel. No, 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 no. You have the square here. So I have an extra milla, right? One of the millis cancels with the kilo, but I still have an extra milli, so I still have 16 milliwatts, okay? And then we go one more and we have two milla, amp squared times two kilo ohm, same deal, and we get eight, eight milliwatts, okay? Notice these three are positive numbers as we predicted. They all are absorbing, and this is a negative number, uh, and it is delivering. And if I total it up, um, if I say four plus 16 plus eight, 
Well, we got 20 here plus eight, that's 28. Yay, that cancels out and we get conservation of energy, right? So the 28 milliwatts matches the total power delivered. Okay, this is a complete problem. This is nice. I hope this is uh, uh, solidifying the theory that we've learned in the first two lectures and showing consistency um, and also highlighting some of the little trickiness that can uh, can go on when you're trying to solve these problems. Make sure when you're doing the homework to not use the homework solutions as a crutch, but to really uh, focus in and figure out, well, why is everything the way it is? Okay. All right, let's do the next problem. So the next problem, very similar. Uh, we have three sources. Notice we have an independent current source in this case. Um, and the question is, find I, so where's I? I is this guy, okay. What's V1 here? Good. V2, V3. Again, V3, there's no element. It's just like a measurement. Uh, and then what's V4? V4 is the voltage across the current source. Now, this is a, <laughs> this is kind of a, um, I don't know, not tricky, but um, a misunderstanding that I even had when I was a student learning electronics. This, I was like, is, can there be a voltage across a current source? Can there be current through a voltage source? And the answer is yes for both. So yes, you can have a non-zero voltage across an independent current source and you can have a non-zero current running through uh, independent voltage source. So yes, there, you can't just assume that V4 is zero and I've seen students make that mistake I've made that mistake as a, as a student. So uh, let's not make that assumption, okay? All right, so let's go through and just kind of highlight, well, what can we, um, what can we know right off the bat? Well, looks like everything is, is in series, right? There's no extra branches anywhere. So this current is gonna be the same through everything. But hey, we have a current source and uh, we already know what the current, and this is gonna be the same through everything. So by KCL, I can immediately see this I better have the same value as this one, but because they're pointed, the, the reference arrows are pointed in opposite directions, this is gonna be the opposite sign, all right? Um, oh, and I think I wrote that perfect. My first step here is to note that this current is negative three milliamps. Again, we gotta be careful with these millis and kilos like the previous problem. Okay, if we have this I, that's actually great. That opens up a lot, because that means we can solve for these Vs, right? V1 and V2, that's kind of for free, right? If I can solve for these V1 and V2s, it looks like I'll get those voltages. And then look, I'll know this voltage, this voltage, this voltage, this voltage. I think a KVL would allow us to solve for this voltage. Once I have, once I have this voltage, it looks like I could do a KVL here and solve for this third voltage, right? So that's something that I recommend doing. Even before, notice I didn't start like rapidly crunching equations. I just kind of uh, marinated in it, marinated in the idea for a little bit, just in the prom, just to see, well, what could be true? What are the onion layers? That's my old professor said. What are the onion layers I can peel away first, get some, uh, what he would say, low hanging fruit, right? And uh, solve this problem piece by piece, okay? Um, so we have three milliamps going this way right? Three milliamps going this way. Good. And let's do this, these Ohm's laws first. Okay. So these Ohm's laws, uh, V1, okay, for this four kilo, kilo ohm, if I take this I here and use that as my, uh, as my I that I use in the Ohm's law, I hit the positive terminal. So I get a positive I times four kilo ohms. Good. And if I do an Ohm's law for here, I think I'm going to get a positive again. Uh, yep. V2 is positive I times two kilo ohms. Good. And notice I get negative numbers because this current was negative, okay? Now the kilo and the milli cancel, so I'm left in just plain old volts, right? So negative 12 volts for this guy and negative six volts for this one. Does that make sense? Uh, if the current is actually going this way, I'm gonna have a higher pressure on this side and a higher pressure on this side. And so yes, uh, I think that uh, the voltage because of the polarity is gonna be a negative number for both of these. Yep, okay, consistency is maintained or intuition is maintained. Okay, so the next one is probably a KVL around everything to find V4, okay. Or, oh, maybe in my solution I did a KVL here. That's valid too. So if we do a KVL here, it looks like I have V1, 14 and V3, let's do it. Minus 14 plus V1 plus V3 equals zero. That's what I have written, good. And because I already know V1, I can solve for V3. Um, 
V3 is going to be positive 14 minus V1, and I get uh, 26 because V1 is 12. So I put a negative 12 in here. 14 minus negative 12 becomes positive 26 volts. Good. So V3 is done, and I think the last one is the entire, yep, sure enough, minus 14 plus V1 plus 2 plus V2 plus V4 equals 0, and I can now solve this for V4 because I know these guys and I get positive 30 volts. Yay, so this is 30 volts. All right, okay, so my guess would be this is delivering power if we were to calculate power, right? I think this is the one because if I have a positive voltage and I have current leaving the positive terminal, that means the power absorbed would be negative. And so I bet you this is delivering power. These two are definitely absorbing power, right? Um, this might be delivering power because if the current is forced to run this way, this is also having positive current leave the positive terminal. But this one, I believe, would be absorbing power if the current's running into the positive terminal, right? Okay, but I think, I think that is our, what we can gain for our intuition. Okay, so let's look at the first one. So for the 14 volt, uh, <laughs> Power is going to be, if I just use, don't look, worry about the numbers yet, I, uh, sorry, this current arrow is going to leave the positive terminal. So from the current arrow perspective, hitting the negative terminals, I'm going to use the negative equation, I times 14, okay? But I know that the current number is negative, so I'm going to get a negative negative, which makes a positive, and I know I'm getting a positive 40, 42 milliamp, milli watts. Ooh, I think I made a little mistake. I put volts. This should be watts, ladies and gentlemen. Good. Okay, so I have milliwatts here, positive, and yes, I believe that's what our intuition had stated before, that this is going to absorb power. Okay, let's keep going. So now the next one, let's look at the four kilo ohm version. So from just the arrow direction, so if this arrow goes around, it's hitting the positive terminal, so we're going to use the positive version for the power, I times V1, excellent. And so now we're going to plug in the values, negative 3 milliamps times negative 12 for the volts, because that's what V1 was, and I should get positive 36 milliwatts, excellent, that absorbs power. Okay, let's go to the next one. For the two volt, I comes around, hits the positive terminal, I get the positive version of the power law. Now I plug in the numbers, negative three, two, ah, negative six milliwatts. It's delivering, yes, and that's what we thought, right? Okay, and then we go to the last one, uh, two kilo, uh, the two kilo ohm one, I goes into here, and uh, positive terminal, yep, positive version, I times V2, plug in the numbers, negative, negative, so I get a positive 18 milliwatts. Okay, fantastic. This is absorbing power. Again, resistors should always be absorbing power, not delivering. Okay, um, and then we have for this three milliamp current source, um, I going into here times uh, the uh, V4, looks like it goes to the positive terminal, we get the positive, negative three, 30 volts. That's what we calculated before way down here. And we have negative 90 milliwatts. Good, this is the main delivering source. Okay, now if we added it up. If we took negative 96 here, we better get a positive 96 here, right? And if we calculate 42 plus 36 plus 18, sure enough, we get 96. So that balances out. Excellent. Okay, not too bad. So this is just a simple example, um, but it shows how we can use KVL, KCL, Ohm's Law, and the power equations. Kind of puts all the stuff that we learned in the last two lectures together. So really good simple little examples. Okay, let's keep moving. So let's look at a switch, right? And this is, we're assuming, an ideal switch, okay? Now circuit breakers are switches and obviously they don't follow, follow ideal assumptions, right? But in our class for right now, we are going to use the ideal assumption, right? And what's the ideal assumption for a switch? Well, there's two states, either open or closed. Now, when it's open, no current flows, right? And this is the symbol for a switch when it's open, okay? So you have an open circuit. Um, if we were to put labels, treat this like an element, put a current and a voltage across, uh, for an open switch, I is zero, right? No current is flowing, and V could be anything not zero. It's so tempting to think that uh, of this V could be is zero, 
right? Not true. In fact, what's an open circuit that you come across every day where you know that voltage is not zero? One of these guys, right? This power plug is an open circuit, but it has 120 volts, not zero, right? Not good, okay? So make sure that you don't make the false assumption that just because it's an open circuit, it has zero volts. Zero current, yes, zero volts, right? So not necessarily zero. Now, one thing I wanna point out in, in real life, in a circuit breaker, can you get non-zero uh, non current even though the switch is opening? Oh, you sure can, and that is the cause of major arc flash, right? As you're opening or closing a switch with high voltage across, as that switch contactor gets close, or if you're, it's already contacting and it starts breaking, an arc will occur and that can be very dangerous. That's where you have to wear all your safety and PPE. And I mean, you, you just gotta be careful about doing that, right? So there's all sorts of uh, hazards that go along with, with circuit breakers, especially the big ones, right? Um, but yes, this is a simple switch, but in real life, uh, there's a lot more to this. Okay, let's look at uh, the ideal switch when we're closed, okay? Uh, the voltage is zero and you have a closed switch, right? And here, this voltage across the switch is zero, but the current could be anything, right? Because now it's like a wire. And just like any wire, you could have any non-zero current, right? Um, and it, again, it's easy to make the assumption, oh, I have a closed switch, current must be zero. No, 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 no. If you have an open switch, the current is zero for our ideal assumption, um, but the voltage we will assume is zero. Now in reality, again, in reality, is the voltage perfectly zero? Not necessarily. Every wire, every physical device may have a bit of internal resistance, right? And so because there's internal resistance via Ohm's law, um, if you have current running through it, you're gonna have uh, a non-zero voltage across it, okay? All right. So hopefully that covers the, the basics of the ideal switch, but you guys know in reality, uh, some of these assumptions get broken very quickly, okay? All right, let's keep moving. So let's look at resistors now. So resistors in series, I think you've seen this before in, in your physics too, um, they add, it's very simple. And so if you have multiple resistors, R1, R2, R3, and I wanted to write it just as one equivalent resistor, one big resistor, R equivalent is just R1 plus R2 plus R3. That's it, okay? If you have five resistors in series, R1 plus R2 plus R3 plus R4 plus R5, and you can just squash it down. And this understanding of this just helps you, um, what do you call it, reduce down your circuit and, and kind of uh, mentally visualize a simpler system instead of something with a lot of resistors. Okay, the next slide is parallel resistance. And so we don't just add, we add the reciprocal. Okay, so if you have multiple resistors in parallel, the equivalent resistance is, this is dictated by this equation. One over R equivalent equals one over R1 plus one over R2 plus one over R3. So we're adding the reciprocal, okay? Um, one way to do it, is, uh, another version of this that's equivalent is just divide this whole thing, you know, or take one over this whole thing on the side, and then you get the R equivalent in the upstairs, right? Um, here's a very simple example. If I have five, two, and three, I, and I want to find the equivalent resistance for this entire thing, then I could use this formula, one over one fifth plus one half plus one third, and I get 0.97. Something to note though, it's very interesting. Notice how, look at these numbers. Look at this number 0.97. That number is actually smaller than even the smallest number. What is that saying? That means if I add more resistors in parallel, I actually get a smaller overall resistance. It sure does. Yes, that's exactly what it's saying. And let's think about why. Imagine you are current flowing into this distribution branch of resistors and then coming back. If you're current, you get to go, if you only had the two ohm resistor, then you only have this rough pipe to flow through. But if I add this three ohm resistor, now I have two pipes, right? So it's actually easier to go through these two pipes than just one pipe. So the overall resistance is actually less than just that two ohm. If I add another resistor, the overall resistance is even less, right? 
And so as I add more resistors, the overall resistance goes down, which means for the same voltage across it, I would actually pull more current. And this is a very practical, practical uh, uh, situation. I want you to imagine, let's say you have PG&E. PG&E is this monster voltage source. And I'm going through, and let's say I'm home one. This is a home one. And I've turned on my air conditioning, right? So current is going into home one. But let's say my neighbor turns on the air conditioning, and that neighbor turns on the air conditioning, and that neighbor turns on the air conditioning. So all these are in parallel. Well, if PG&E is keeping the same voltage, as I add more homes in parallel, pulling more current, what happens to the overall current being pulled from PGE? PG&E, this number is getting bigger. And that is why when you pull too many things, your generation system could shut down because then the, the trippers and whatever, all the safety is going, whoa, too much current, open up everything and everyone loses power. And I believe this is the same is true for your ship. If you have too many, uh, too many devices online, well, what is something that you've been trained to do? Click them off, right? So that way you're not pulling too much power from your generators, right? So this idea of resistors in parallel is fundamental to uh, your ship operations and all your operations. So yeah, very, very uh, good, good concept here. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, now here's a little trick, and this I actually use quite often. If I just have two resistors in parallel, I can still use this fundamental equation, right? This is always true for any number of resistors in parallel, but I actually can reduce it down to this kind of easier form. So instead of R equivalent equals one over one over one, one over one over R1 plus one over R2, I can do this one, R1, R2 over R1 plus R2. And you're like, well, where'd you get this? Well, you get it from here. Okay, that's just this one with two resistors. But notice I'm just multiplying the top and bottom by R1, R2, R1, R2. This is quantity one, right? So it's valid to do that. And notice the numerator becomes this, but the denominator becomes R1, R2 over R1. The R1s cancel, so I'm left with R2. R1, R2 over R2, the R2s cancel, I'm left with R1. And so this is just a little trick, a little trick that makes you just a little bit faster when you're doing your calculations, right? And it immediately gives you, uh, what do you call it? The answer in the numerator as well. This would too, but maybe in your calculator, it's just easier to punch this in versus punching this in. It's up to you. Either one's equivalent, but I just thought I'd share this um, trick for two resistors in parallel. Okay. Let's keep going into the last part. And the last part, we're gonna talk about this thing called a galvanometer. And we're gonna talk about how can we use a galvanometer in a very, very simple multimeter circuit. And again, all it's doing is we're pulling in um, the concepts that you learned uh, in the first two lectures. All right, so a multimeter is this. Now it doesn't have a galvanometer in it, but the there's old school, in fact, on the ship, you guys have so many galvanometers all over your control station, right? And they're just this guy, it has a needle and uh, you can apply voltage, which creates current going through it, okay? But essentially a galvanometer, galvanometer is a current sensor. The more this needle moves, more current is flowing through the coil. It's basically a little mini motor. That's really what it is, okay? And so let's see how this works. And this Lee, how we could take this current sensor and use it to build a very rudimentary multimeter. And what does the multimeter allow us to measure? It allows us to measure volts. It allows us to measure resistance. It allows us to measure current. And of course, you got to be careful depending on which you know connector you're in. But it's a, a multi-metering device, right? So let's see how we can first understand this and then understand a multimeter circuit. Okay, so it directly measures current. Once you can measure current, you can indirectly measure voltage and resistance, and it utilizes your physics to Lorentz force right hand rule. Uh, if you forgot your Lorentz force right hand rule, uh, when you take ET350, you'll get one of these. Um, this is a cube that reminds us what the Lorentz force is. It is actually this equation, IL cross B. So what do we have here? The current, uh, a current with wire uh, of length uh, L uh, crossed with an external magnetic field is gonna develop a force on that wire. So if I have I 
BF or ILBF. That's actually matching this cube. See I here, E here, and F there. Okay. So if I have some magnet, oh, here we go. We got a magnet, and the magnetic field in this case is going from north to south, so it's going this way. Okay. If I have current running through these wires, I will generate a force on that wire. So let's follow this figure. So let's say here I have a positive terminal of a battery. So if you if you carefully look, you have current running through here and it's going in, you see the little arrow in there and actually going into the page. Okay, so that's the case. If I have current, positive current going into the page and B, the flux density is going to the right, this force is in fact going down. Okay, so that means this is trying to torque it to the right. Let's follow the other side. So let's say the current's going this way, it's going around and around and around like this. So on this side is actually coming towards us out of the page. Let's flip the direction of current, but the B stays the same and the force goes up. That's good. So this side, the force goes up, this side, the force goes down. So with positive current, this whole thing is gonna torque this way clockwise and torque this needle to the right. If I had negative current, then it's gonna torque the other way and torque it to the left. Does that make sense? Now there's these springs here that kind of passively uh, keep it, you know, pegged on the left, but this does have the ability to measure, you could have a centering one where it could measure positive and negative torque, okay? I've drawn this uh, here, but these, is, it's exactly the same figure here, right? B goes to the right on this side, current's going in, force going down, yeah. okay. So we'll call this current that goes in here IG for the galvanometer current. But really what it's saying is this galvanometer current can be measured by the needle. So this is a known quantity. We just read it right off our galvanometer, right? So I want you to keep that in mind when we go through this analysis, right? And so I repeat, we can use this galvanometer as a multimeter to get voltage resistance and current, right? Okay, so let me put this on this side. Now, the simple multimeter circuit is going to look like this. It's really not that bad. So let me see if I can make a comparison. Let's say I have my galvanometer, which is, rep is going to be represented by this screen. I have some factory calibrated resistor that I know. And then I have the selector switch, which is essentially this, right? I can change to the different modes, right? And then I have this external circuit here. And I have ground, which is a, the black probe. And then depending on which setting I'm, I'm going to use, th these three could be the red probe. So if I'm on the voltmeter setting like this one here, then let's say I'm using this red probe here and this black probe. If I'm the, on the ohm meter setting, which is this one, then I'm on this setting and this one. And if I'm on the current setting, then I'm going to be over here, okay? And then I got to switch the probe to, of course, that guy. Make sure you always do that on a multimeter. Okay. So let's see what's going on. We're going to make an assumption. We know RG, RS, R0, RP, VS. These are all factory calibrated values. So, so they're all numbers like, you know, nine volts, you know, two ohms, whatever. These are known numbers. And this is G, our galvanometer. That's this guy. And so IG is going to flow through our galvanometer, which means we're going to assume this is letting us know what IG is. We're not thinking of G as a current source. It is a measurement device, right? It allows us to measurement, measure IG, okay? So let's look at these one by one. Um, and like I said, all we're doing here is uh, seeing how the principles that we just learned can be applied to practical uh, applications, all right? So let's look at the first, the voltmeter. So the voltmeter is this circuit. So it's this one here. And with a voltmeter, what we're saying is I have my multimeter and I'm measuring some unknown elements voltage, right? Or maybe it's a known element, but it's an unknown voltage. And I want to know what this V is, right? Okay, so you can see I'm following RS, switch, resistor, galvanometer back. And the current through this is IG, okay? Now, here's something you want to recognize. We don't want this IG to be a very big number. In fact, we want this IG to be a very, very small number, right? Because we don't want a lot of current to flow through this thing we're measuring. And the reason why we want it to be a small number is because we don't want to damage this part. Um, the, also, the other thing we want, to know, we want to note is that this galvanometer here takes just a little teeny bit of current to make that needle move. So it's a very sensitive measurement device. So you might have a big resistance here just to make sure you don't break your galvanometer. Okay, 
Okay, so let's say again, RG, RS are known. We can even label the voltages easily um, just so that we can uh, do this analysis. And so the question is, can we come up with an expression to solve for this V if we assume this, this, this are known, right? Okay, we can follow our analysis. My KVL minus V plus VRS plus VG equals zero. Let's assume the voltage across the galvanometer is zero, okay? And it looks like if I solve for this V in terms of these two voltages, I just bring this over, I get VRS plus VG. The other nice thing is we can apply Ohm's law again. VRS equals positive IGRS and VG equals positive IGRG, right? Boom, boom. Oh, look, I can plug these two things in here and I get this very simple expression. V equals IG times this plus IG times that, okay? Well, why is this a nice expression? This is a nice expression because I can read IG from the needle, right? IG is being read from the galvanometer, and these are factory calibrated values. So that means the voltage is equal to my galvanometer reading times these two values, whatever they happen to be from the factory. That's great. And as this changes, that lets, that lets me know this changes. So if IG gets bigger times some number, this is going to get bigger. So this is a simple voltmeter circuit. Okay, not too bad, not too bad. Okay, I'm gonna keep this figure on the side and we'll bring it back when we look at the next one. Okay, let's look at the ohm meter one. So the ohm meter circuit is now this middle branch. Okay, so in this middle branch, we are now taking a resistor. I'm taking my resist, I'm putting it on the ohm meter setting here and I'm going doing this. Right? I'm touching these two leads and I'm measuring this resistance. I don't know what that resistance is. I want to measure it, but now I'm connecting it to this middle branch. Okay, So on this middle branch, I have R0, I have some voltage, I have RG in the galvanometer again. Okay, All right, so I know R0, I know Vs. Okay, This is a known quantity, no quantity, and I get this from the needle. I don't know R and I don't know this V here. Okay, All right. So can we come up with an expression to solve for R in terms of these known values? All right, okay. So what is known again? IG from the needle, RG, VS, and R0. Okay, so if we look at what we can do, well, we, got, we can use Ohm's law, right? Uh, we have V equals minus RGR, okay? or R equals minus V over RG if I solve this, right? And why minus? Because this I goes into the negative terminal. Okay, great. I don't know V, but I know IG. So that means if I can get an expression for V in terms of all the stuff knowns, I can get the expression for R. Okay, KVL, perfect. Minus V plus VR0 plus VS plus VG equals zero. Fantastic. I can solve for this V, just bring it over the other side. Great. And I believe I can then apply two more Ohm's laws, right? Sure enough, VR equals positive IGR zero, VG equals positive IGRG, great. And I just pop, punch those two things in. And so now my overall resistance here that I don't know can now be written in terms of things I do know in this weird kind of expression, minus RG, R, IGR zero plus VS plus IGRG over IG, okay? So this is the final kind of solution here, right? So IG is from the needle and this is uh, known, right? Now, um, this isn't really the, what do you call it, that important. What's, what the important part is, are you able to follow the steps to get an expression in terms of these unknowns, right? That's kind of the point of all this. But it's kind of neat how we can take this current sensor and this kind of external circuitry and figure out what this resistance is, okay? All right. Let's keep going. And this is the last one. This is the ammeter one, okay? Okay, so the ammeter one, let me move this to the top, is now this bottom circuit, right? Okay. Now for this ammeter one, the reason why, I mean, you might be asking the question, well, why don't we I have a current sensor? Why don't you just directly hook up the current sensor to whatever source you're measuring, right? Well, the problem is this only takes a little bit of current. If you take too much current, this is going to break your galvanometer, right? So you want a way to kind of uh, protect this galvanometer and still have current. And that's what this RP is for. This RP, look at this, 
I is going to go through here and most of the I is going to go into this guy, right? So let's say what's going to probably happen is RP is a very low number. So if this current is flowing through, it would rather go path of least resistance through this low resistance value than probably this one, which is going to be a high resistance value. Okay. A little will trickle in so that we can get a measurement, but the majority of this current is going to measure, be measured through here. Okay. So this current goes in through here. And let's see how this can still pick up what this current is. Okay, so we can use our, our new friend KCL. KCL says I equals these two leaving currents. Up. Current entering equals the current leaving at this node. Okay, we can get IG from your galvanometer. IP we still don't know yet, right? And like I said, IP and I are nearly the same, all right? Okay, the next one is Ohm's law. We can apply Ohm's law to this guy, right? Because we know what this resistance is. And so VP equals positive IPRP, right? And we still have the Ohm's law for this guy, all right? Uh, what else do we have? We have a KVL. KVL, we can do a KVL loop around here, which means that these two are the same voltage, right? VP equals VG, that's great. Um, if VP equals VG, that means these two are the same, and that's what I have written here. Okay, uh, and then I can solve IP in terms of IG and plug that back into this guy and I finally get this expression. So this is nice because now this total current coming in here is equal to this current times this ratio, right? Notice RG is a very big number and RP is a smaller number. And so overall, this is a kind of a big number. Remember, IG is just gonna be a little trickle current. So as this changes, you're gonna amplify it, right? Multiply it by this big number and you get then this I, okay? Um, this is kind of a nice thing, like practical wise, more current goes through here, trickle current, but this is kind of how uh, sensors work. You get a little teeny signal, you amplify it, and then you can get a reading on the entire signal, right? Now, are these things subject to noise? Yes, for sure. If I have a little bit of noise here, what am I, what am I doing? Am I, I'm amplifying it and I'm getting this. Yeah, there's problems. Uh, there's filtering that you can do. We will actually talk about low pass and high pass filtering in this class. Um, so that could solve some noise issues. But at the end of the day for this lecture, I just want you to get a sense of how, how do these electronics take these small signals? How do we, can we still use our basic uh, KVL, KCL, Ohm's law? Does it apply? And sure enough, yes, it does, okay? That's all I got for this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it. Like and subscribe and uh, I'll see you all in class.